So our results. Our sample size, we entered um, 563 patients, first admissions. We ended up actually with a total sample of 700 because um, our patients kept coming back in, uh, which is, I guess, not surprising. Um, patients and caregivers wanted the patients to enter the study because we were providing this information in the care record. We were able to do this electronically, so everyone asked the patients to re-enter the study, which we allowed. So these results really are on the first admissions of the patients. So for every 100 patients that were entered the study, we found that 40 of them had equal to or more than one discrepancy. And of those, 72% had a discrepancy that our rating team felt could have caused harm. So that means 28 out of every 100 patients had a discrepancy that could cause potential harm. So how was harm evaluated? We had two physicians and two pharmacists, Bob, who was one of them, who were not part of the intervention team, who actually, with Excel spreadsheets, rated hundreds of discrepancies. And we rated them on a level of one to three, which we found in the literature, one being probably no harm would have occurred, two, moderate harm could have been could have occurred had we not detected it, and three, serious harm could have occurred. So what did we find out as far as the cost? Because we know that adding on cost in the healthcare system is really not realistic at this point in time. So what we used is we used Bates' original article um, from 1997 that was reported in JAMA. Um, and the economist that we worked with essentially inflated um, the 50, I think it was, I can't remember, $5,700 to the 2008 level of, of an adverse drug event, which would have been $9,300. The intervention cost per patient was $32. Now, we got the $32 by using the nurse time, the pharmacist time, and the physician time. So we counted their time and their benefits. Um, we did not count indirect time. So the actual intervention of all components cost $32 per patient. Our break even with this would have been if we prevented one adverse event in 290 patient encounters. So our data, as I said, said 28 in 100 patient encounters, and that would have been 81 adverse drug events in 290 patient encounters. Again, the unknown is how many of these, if we had not intercepted, would have actually resulted in adverse event. I will tell you that over half of our um, discrepancies were on discharge. So we had a lot of contact with our patients after discharge because some of the time we found the discrepancy when the patient had gone home. So we needed to contact them and make sure that they had the correct medication information. So the importance of findings, um, well we feel this does improve patient safety. Um, improves the appropriateness of care, and again, this is something that I think we all need to think about as we ask the bedside care team to perform medication reconciliation as part of the Joint Commission's requirement. This is a very difficult task for certainly this subset of patients. Um, we would reduce the cost of health care if we prevent any of the adverse drug events. And we do think this supports the need for a national patient record. We would not have been able to detect these discrepancies with our current records. So next steps. Well, we think the model is feasible, replicable, and our goal is to now make a dissemination plan and hopefully sell it to um, our hospital so that we can implement this. And actually, these results have not, the team meets next Tuesday to actually look through the study results. So these are brand new results. Um, the Joint Commission, we feel this should certainly be a model that we at least talk to them about. Um, because we think other hospitals may be interested in at least attempting to look at this type of model and certainly recognizing the indirect, the, the time that this second team took um, and can the direct care providers actually do complete medication reconciliation. In our community pharmacy, they, and I, Rite Aid is the only reason I put that in is because Baltimore is full of Rite Aid pharmacies and they're in every community um, and that's what our patients use, but any of the community pharmacies we called um, they need to be part of the information system. We can e-prescribe to them, but if we can't get that information back from them in the record, then it's all a manual call again. So part of the consideration should be that. Finally, 
Um, the last next step is we actually knew that we had a lot of issues after the patients went home. Our patients took an average of seven and a half medications. And so what we did is we actually decided to do a small pilot study where we actually went to the patient's home and visited them. So we were able to visit um, about a dozen patients, and we were trying to find out what the patients actually were doing at home. And I'll just tell you two very short stories. We actually called them at 48 hours, and then we went to see them within 10 days. The first patient um, was a 35-year-old lady who had been admitted for GI bleeding. She had 15, a 15-year history of diabetes, so she was an insulin-dependent uh, diabetic. And I'll just show you her the little bag here from Rite Aid. Um, she was still having some GI bleeding, had already been into the emergency room of another hospital. Of course, we're not all connected, so we didn't know <clears throat> until she told us. And one of the medications we had prescribed was protonics. So among all the meds that she had on the counter, we were looking for the protonics. And in the bag, the nurse found a note that her managed care company wouldn't fill the prescription. So there was a recommendation for her to call her physician. There were two other medications that were recommended. And the patient was so overwhelmed with all the meds she was taking, she never realized she didn't have that particular medication. So needless to say, we were able to intervene and link her up with a case management program. The other lady actually knew every medication she was taking, um, and her sister and her nephew all helped her. The only problem she had is she actually stored her medication in this um, pillbox. So on occasion, which we thought was probably infrequently, but then the sister said was actually more frequently, if she forgot to take the medication in the morning and didn't remember to the evening, she wasn't really sure, and these were cardiac and blood pressure meds. So we found that she was probably missing her meds about three times a week. So just by sitting there with her and redistributing meds into the type of pill container that we had, we were able to take care of that intervention. So talking on the phone to her, and we'll close, um, we did not detect this. She knew her medication. She knew them generically. Um, but when we went to the home, that's what we were able to find. So we think this is an important component um, that we're going to look at as taking the next steps for this community, because we think this is very important um, for the community as a whole. The team was great. We hung in there all together. Um, our physician support was great. They always backed us up if we had any clinical issues. Um, and I guess we all stayed together for two years. So. <laughs> Okay, and certainly thank you for this. <laughs>